on our mind but our holy God Father Lord this time is your this session is yours this day is yours Lord in the name of Jesus there is healing there is freedom there is victory there is life every brokenness Every broken relationship restored in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. I say there is life in the name of Jesus. There is healing in the name of Jesus. How many of you believe that it is possible for your life to be completely changed, transformed, renewed, restored in the name of Jesus. I want, I want you to lift your hands up to heaven. How many of you believe that? That you can walk out of here transformed on fire for Jesus. How many of you believe that if there's a sickness in you this morning, that you can walk out of this room, that you can walk out of this day completely healed? Because I say, my God is a healer. I don't want you to think that today is a day where you just hear some things and walk out of here. But I want you to believe that I will walk out of this day completely completely changed head to toe saturated in the fire of the Holy Spirit filled with the love of Jesus abiding right next to him I want you to believe that this morning thank you Lord that you make it all possible Father Lord not because of something that we have done. We are not here by accident, Lord. It is your plan, Father God. It is your purpose that we are here this morning, Father God. And so we come before you, Lord, with an open heart, with an open mind, Father God, to do whatever it is, Father Lord, that you want to do today, Father Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. And we ask this, Lord, in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you turn to your neighbor and just tell your neighbor, hey neighbor, you're looking good today. Now your other neighbor as well. <coughs> now turn to the neighbor behind you and say the same. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Let's all get settled. Amen. We have an exciting day in store for you today. Amen. Amen. I, I believe that you're going to encounter God today. 
Amen. I mean, some of you have come with the mindset that I'm just going to have some fun, meet some friends. Boys meet some girls, girls meet some boys and walk out of here. But this morning, I just, I just, I just know in the spirit, just wait for it. Amen. You're going to encounter God. Amen. Amen. What I want to do is um, do a bit of teaching. Okay. Um, in this session, I want to talk to you about something very important. See, firstly, a couple of things. Firstly, I'm not going to treat you guys as kids. You're not kids, right? I'm going to treat you as mature Christians. Amen? Because I've been to the Sunday schools that you have gone to as well. We're not new Christians. We are not babies in Christ, right? Some of you look like babies, but I know that you're not babies, right? So I'm going to treat you. Is that okay? Is that, is that okay that I treat you as grown-ups? You sure? Amen. All right. So what I'm going to talk to you about, the, the title of what I'm going to talk to you about is the most important question. I want you to pay very attention. The way I speak, I like to be real, okay? I like to be real. I don't like to sugarcoat the word of God. I, want, I, like, I love to keep it very real. Is that okay as well, that I keep it real? Amen. So the title of what I'm going to talk about today is the most important question. If you read the book of Luke, it tells us that Jesus was on his way, going from town to town, village to village, making his journey towards Jerusalem. Where is he heading? Towards his death in Jerusalem. Okay, so he's not going to Jerusalem for a holiday. He's going to Jer Jerusalem to die, to fulfill his mission as the Lamb of God to be sacrificed. And yet, he doesn't waste any opportunity through the way to talk about the kingdom. He heals people. He shares the good news. Now, while in that journey one day, a man comes to him with a very interesting question, a very important question. I want you to listen to me. It's found in Luke chapter 13 verses 23. Lord, will those who are saved be few? Right? So what's the question that the guy asked Jesus? Lord, will those who are saved be few? In other words, the majority of the people in the world, are they heading to heaven? Or are they heading to hell? How would you guys answer that question? The majority of the people that are living are heading to heaven or are they heading to hell? Any, any answer? I, I hear heaven, I hear hell. You know, if you are someone that goes to funerals, has anyone been to a funeral? You know what a funeral is, right? If you are someone that goes to funerals very often, your answer would have to be that majority of people are going to heaven. Why is that? Because have you been to any funeral where you heard a pastor praying and saying, God, we pray for this poor brother who's roasting in hell right now. Have you, have you heard that? No. Every funeral that we go to, where are we sending our brothers and sisters to? To heaven. So if you've been to funerals often, your answer would have to be that the majority of the people are heading to heaven, right? So it is not justification by faith. It's not justification by works. It seems like it's justification by death. If you want to go to heaven, all you need to do is what? Die, right? I mean, you kind of start thinking in that manner. So wide and merciful is God that surely everyone is headed to heaven. But let's see how Jesus answers that question. 
So what is the question again? Lord, will those who are saved be few? In Luke 13, 24, Jesus says, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. Now there's a parallel passage in Matthew as well, Matthew 7, 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. Did you hear me? What is Jesus saying? How is Jesus answering that question? The gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. And the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. Now it gets worse. It gets worse. Because Jesus doesn't stop with the narrow and wide. And he doesn't stop with the few and the many. Jesus says once the master closes the door. Are you with me? Once the master closes the door, many will stand outside the door and start knocking and say, Lord, Lord, please let us in. I'm talking about very serious matters here. This, I'm not telling you stuff that I am making up in my mind. I'm speaking from the word. Jesus says, many will stand on the outside and say, Lord, Lord, let us in, let us in, please. And in Matthew, he says, some will say, Lord, on the outside, knock and say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not heal people in your name? And to add to that, did I not preach in your name? Did I not lead worship in your name? Did I not, not go to church in your name? Did I not go to Sunday school in your name? Did I not wear like white and white in your name? And this scares me because Jesus says, and I'll say to them, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Listen guys, what this tells me is that the majority of the people that are living today are headed to hell and not to heaven. That's what it tells me. And numbered among them will be many church-going people who did many impressive things in the name of the Lord. Are you with me? Many of these people that are headed to hell are church going people that did many impressive things in the name of the Lord God we led worship Lord we prayed in your name Lord we healed people in your name Lord we preached in your name Lord I went to church in your name Lord I've been a good boy in your name but Jesus says I never knew you So I want to ask you this question. Are you going to be numbered among the few that's that ends up in eternity or the many that ends up in hell? This is a very serious matter, a serious question that I want you to think about. Because the fact that you are sitting here in church is no guarantee the fact that you do impressive things in the name of the Lord even does not guarantee your entry into eternity. Jesus says, I never knew you. This breaks my heart. This makes, this passage makes my job as a pastor all the more harder. I can stand here, make you jump. We can have a good laugh, have a good time. I can impress you with my powerful sermons. But on that day, if we don't meet each other in eternity, 
then i have failed you jesus said i never knew you now what does he mean by i never knew you if you study scripture you can see that it can almost i never knew you can almost interchangeably be used as i didn't choose you for example in amos 3:2 god says to israel you only have i known of all the families of the earth that doesn't mean that god did not know of any other families on earth what it means is israel you alone i chose genesis 18:18 18 to 19 abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him for i have known him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the lord that means i have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the lord 1 corinthians 8:3 but if anyone loves i want you to listen to this 1 corinthians 8:3 but if anyone loves god he is known by him if anyone loves god he is chosen by him one more time if anyone loves god he is known or chosen by him so loving god my dear children is the greatest evidence that you are chosen by god loving god is the greatest evidence that you will spend eternity with christ in heaven are you understanding what i'm saying the fact that you're sitting in church or doing impressive things in the name of the lord means nothing really the bible tells me the bible tells me that the one solid evidence that you are chosen by god that you are known by god that you get to spend eternity with christ one solid evidence that you have is the fact that you love jesus So the most important question that we need to ask ourselves as Christians is not am I going to church am I going to Sunday school am I doing all the good things no it is this question that Jesus asked Peter over and over again in John 21 do you love me do you love me do you love me do you love me I want to ask you that question this morning. Do you love Jesus? I mean seriously. Let's be real, let's be real today. Do you love Jesus? Why did Jesus keep asking that question over and over again because it is my church the most important question it really is do i love jesus is the most important question that you should be asking yourself how important is this jesus said it is the greatest commandment I want to really ask you this question when I say Jesus what emotion rises in you I want to know Is your relationship with this Jesus real? Is he just a religious figure to you? Does the very mention of Jesus stir something in your heart? Are you so in love with Jesus that you're able to say that even if my whole family walks away from God from Jesus I will walk with him? How 
how would you answer that question if Jesus were here today and he asks you, son, daughter, do you really love me? It matters. It really does. More than the question, did you go to Sunday school? Did you go to church? Did you clap your hands? What really matters is this question. And this is for everyone sitting here. We could all be wonderful ministers speaking loudly in tongues, jumping up and down. But unless we truly love Jesus as the word of God, that it all really means nothing. How important is that question? Our life depends on that question. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So the Bible promises us that if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. James 4, 5 says, a spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously for us. The word yearns means to long for something intently and consistently. Listen, I have kids. I have a 10-year-old. I have a 4-year-old. I love them dearly. But if they cry for me at 3 a.m. in the morning, I can't say that I yearn for them. <laughs> Those of your parents will understand. Maybe the rest of the day I can yearn for them. But at 3 a.m. in the morning, come on, give me a break. But the Bible says... The spirit who dwells in us yearns for us jealously. David says in Psalm 139, 17 to 18, How precious are your thoughts about me, O God? I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. You know, if you take a handful of sand from the beach, there are more than millions of grains of sand in, in your hand. You're holding more than million grains of sand in your hand. And the Bible says all the grains of sand in the world, your thoughts, God, about me outnumber them. How many of you know that exaggeration is a lie? So the Bible surely cannot lie. So this must be true. I'm talking about each and every one of you. That means at all times your God is thinking about you. That is his love for you and me. He yearns for us. I want to speak that over someone. You might, going through, you might be going through a, a, a season of depression or brokenness. But I want to point out to you what my Bible says. At every moment, at every second, he's so deeply and compassionately and passionately thinking about you and me. I don't care what your situation is. I don't care what your circumstances look like. But we serve a God that is at all times guaranteed loving us and thinking about us. So here's the question then, my church. I want you to listen to me. If we serve a God that loves us so dearly and is thinking about us at all times, why is it that we struggle to love him? Why is it that we struggle for intimacy with this Lord who loves us so much? You see, for us to have an intimate relationship with God, we need to have one 
key foundation in our lives. And that is what I want to talk about. Psalm 89 verse 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. We need to have fear of the Lord. Amen. Amen. To have this intimate relationship with God, we need to have this thing called Fear of the Lord. How did Jesus teach his disciples to pray? Our Father, hallowed be your name. Come into his presence with holy fear. Am I making sense to you? Am I speaking some other language? I'm just giving you the truth. I'm just giving you the word. Now, unless you have some connection with God, this word will not make any sense to you. Amen. So come into the presence of God with holy fear. Now, holy fear does not mean that you're just scared of God. Right? I want you to pay attention to this. Holy fear does not mean you are scared, you are afraid of God. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. You cannot have an intimate relationship with someone. You're always afraid of God. I don't want to come anywhere near you. I want you to pay attention, very close attention for the next five minutes. When Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, Moses told Pharaoh over and over again, let God says, let my people go so that they can worship me in the wilderness. So Moses was leading Israel out of Egypt, not to take them to the promised land, but to take them to God himself. And when God saw Moses and his people coming, God told Moses, I have been waiting. I bore you on eagle's wings. I got you out of Egypt so that I can see my people. God got Israel out of Egypt so that he can have a relationship with Israel. And so Moses had a private conversation with God and God says, I've been waiting 430 years for this day. I am going to see my people. I'm going to meet my people. In three days, I'm going to come down the mountain. I'm going to meet my people. And But three days later, when God came, the Israelites said, I don't want to see God. We don't want to be in the presence of God. He's too fearful. Moses, you speak to God. And here's what Moses tells them. Exodus 20, 20. Do not fear for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. It is so important that you get this. He says, do not fear for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So Moses is differentiating between two kinds of fear. He's saying, do not fear the Lord that you want to run away from him. But he says, you need to have the kind of fear that stops you from sinning. In other words, have the kind of fear that stops you, that, that, that scares you from being away from the presence of God. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You say, God, I cannot imagine a life lived a second away from you. Are you with me? Are you, are, you, are, you, are you understanding the difference? God is not saying fear the Lord so that a kind of fear that makes you run away from God but a kind of fear that, that whispers in you, God, I, I dare not live a single moment away from this presence of this loving God. That is the kind of fear that we need to have as Christians. A kind of fear that honors God, that respects him. That you, you say, God, without you, I don't want to live this life. Even if it's for a second. Even if it's for a moment. 
if you give me 60 70 years 80 years on this earth every moment of that life i want to spend in relationship with you god i don't i cannot live even for a second away from your presence away from the presence of your glory you know what that kind of fear does to us it makes us hate everything he hates and love everything he loves are you understanding see i cannot live for a second away from the presence of god so i dare not i don't want to associate myself with anything that my lord does not like sin my god does not understand cannot comprehend sin has nothing to do with my lord so i dare not i don't want to think about it because if sin causes me to move away from the presence of my god then i never want to think about it are you understanding what i'm trying to say i love what god loves i hate what he hates that is the kind of fear that we need to have as christians we have it all wrong we think you know i i don't want to sin because if i sin god will beat me I, i'll fail in my in my school that gets you nowhere but if you have the mindset that i am so in love with my savior that i don't want to live or do anything that hurts my god i pray that a generation raises rises that has this kind of attitude about sin the bible says all who fear the lord will hate evil in hebrews chapter 1 when god the father inaugurates jesus introduces jesus as the king of the universe he says hebrews 1:9 because you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness sin therefore god your god has anointed you more than your companions because you have loved righteousness and and hated lawlessness and hated sin therefore god has anointed you we all want to be anointed right we want to be anointed singers anointed preachers anointed ministers anointed men and women of god but god says if you want to be anointed love righteousness and hate lawlessness it's a two step process we love righteousness in the sense that we when we see someone else do something wrong we get annoyed i mean look at that brother look at that sister he does that she does this we get annoyed we get passionate but when we live in sin ourselves we are very tolerant right yes or no so what if god says you need to love righteousness and hate lawlessness you learn to hate sin the way god hates sin and you'll see the anointing of the lord increase in your life the psalmist says in psalm 1 all oh, the joys of those who do not do wicked those who do not sin they delight instead in the law of the lord they meditate on it day and night they're like trees planted along the river bank bearing fruit each season their leaves never wither and they prosper in all they do listen here's the problem here's the problem we have we are living in a society that's training us to tolerate sin we are very tolerant to sin 
you all look like nice boys and girls but if i were to peek have a peek into your private lives be a different story yes or no you may not like me for bringing messages such as these but what matters to me is where you spend eternity right if i truly love you if i truly love you that's what matters most right we live in a society that tolerates sin i have a 10 year old that's growing up in canada so i know i know you know back in the 1990s there was a televangelist you guys know what a televangelist is you know those evangelists that come on tv and this guy was the most famous at the time he had a huge following he had the largest television audience ministry but soon he became famous for other reasons he was involved in a lot of scandal affairs he was eventually sentenced to 45 years in prison but later that sentence was reduced to 8 years and all the christians all of a sudden didn't want to do anything with him they don't want to associate themselves with him so after spending 2 years in prison one pastor who felt compassionate decided to go visit this televangelist and as soon as he went into prison this man came and gave this pastor a huge hug they don't know each other but full of love he came and gave this pastor a huge hug and this pastor had tears in his eyes and the televangelist said don't worry about me this is not god's judgment this is his mercy because if i had continued living the way i lived i would have suffered in hell for the rest of my life and then with great excitement they started talking and the televangelist said you know we have started a bible study group in prison every day we spend 2 to 3 hours reading the word <coughs> and the pastor said wow that's amazing you must be leading that that bible study group and to which the televangelist said no not me i will never lead again i am happy just being in the presence of god because i failed god i walked away from god and after talking for about 30 minutes or so so the pastor got comfortable with this man and he asked this man this question hey you know i have seen your ministry i have seen you on tv crying out for the lord for people with so much compassion for people so much passion to serve the lord running day and night for the lord what changed when did you stop loving ministry when did you stop loving to serve god and to which the televangelist responded listen pastor i never stopped love, loving to serve the lord I still love to do it. I never stop loving doing those things, being on the pulpit, you know, running and doing things for the Lord, seeing people get saved. But what changed was that I stopped loving Jesus. I did not have the fear of the Lord anymore. and then the televangelist grabbed the hands of the pastor and it scared the pastor and he leaned towards the pastor and said pastor there are many like me in this world that's running around doing things for the lord 
they're in big positions they do this and that and they're famous but they have no love for the lord they have no fear of the lord which is why this matters church this is why i was urged to bring this message to you growing up in the middle east i know we are good at pretending we are really good at it because in many ways that's what our parents want just for us to look good in church right so we pretend we come and sit here in church i know i'm like you i was here till the age of 19 it's after that i moved away we love to pretend like you know we are spiritual clap our hands do the things that we need to do so that everyone looks at us and says hey he's good he's pretty good <coughs> but do you love god do you love jesus i'm asking you this very important question I want you to examine yourself and ask yourself that question do I love Jesus please I'm not here to just give you some impressive word and go back I want you to think hard about this question do I love Jesus You can fool me you can fool the person sitting next to you you can fool your parents i have no patience for christians that's living a deceptive life i have no patience i tell you I've shared this often many years ago I was in prayer sitting in prayer on the floor crying out to the Lord and all of a sudden as I was praying I saw in the spirit a word put up in front of me and the word was deception and then God started showing me faces of many men in ministry many and this the, the, these images kept flashing in front of me and i asked god god what's going on what's happening and i started crying and then this is what really hit me god looks at me i heard so clearly the voice of the lord, of the lord looking at me and saying hey don't think you are immune to deception as well so make sure son that you abide in me every step that you take and that day i decided lord it's okay that no one knows me it's okay that i may do whatever kind of ministry but i never want to be a deceptive minister i deceive myself and i deceive the church all that matters to people these days is oh i just want to be on, on the stage i want some five people to see me i want to be on the committee i want to be in certain positions i want people to recognize me i i want to be known i want people to say i'm holy he's good but that doesn't matter according to the word of god what matters is your and my love for jesus that's what matters Oh I pray I pray oh, that some of you at least will decide today no longer am I going to live this deceptive life I'm no longer I'm going to be a pretend Christian I know there are many of you in this room If I'm a Christian I want to be head over heels in love with Jesus can that be your prayer church I plead with you my dear Christians 
at least have a desire for intimacy with God. Do you love Jesus? Can you do that for me? For me at least for the next two weeks, every morning when you get up. I want you to ask yourself that question, do I love Jesus? Can, can you do that for me? Yeah, how many of you will do that? When you wake up in the morning, ask yourself that question, do I love Jesus? Put your hands down. The key foundation to having intimacy with God is a fear of God. I told you I'm not going to teach you, treat you as little children. Why does love for God matter? It is the greatest commandment. Our destiny depends on it. Jesus says, strive to enter through the narrow gate. I want to ask you that question. Are you going to be numbered among the few that gets to spend eternity in heaven with Christ? Or are you going to be numbered among the many that will find yourself in that place where, is, where, where there is weeping and gnashing? Oh, I... I, I'm not able to move on from this important question. Church Christianity is not a matter of conferences. It's not a matter of doing the big things and looking grand. That is not what Christianity... I mean, can you imagine And at the end of all of this, we can have 200 meetings, ICPF, this... That, all that. But what is the point if at the end of the day you have no love for Jesus? Really, what's the point? You might as well sit at home. Where there's weeping and gnashing. I, you know, I, I sometimes think weeping and gnashing represents the two kinds of people that will be found in hell. You'll be, you'll, you have the gnashers. The gnashers are a representation of human fury. Angry with God. God, how dare you put me in hell? You know, even in hell, they're denying God. Oh, they're angry. God, how dare you? Who do you think you are? And then you have the weepers. Lord, I failed. You have mercy on me. You know, one thing I know. I was thinking about it myself. If I, if I find myself in hell somehow, I'll have to be a weeper. Are you understanding why? Because God gave me the truth. God gave me the word. I knew everything. He gave me plenty of opportunities to run after him, to know him. And even after that, if I find myself in hell, it clearly shows me that I chose myself over him. It's not injustice. Every time I sinned, I have asserted my will, will over his will, over the creator's will. I have declared that I am sovereign. So please don't tell me hell is injustice. I know. I know there are many among us that do not even believe in hell because hell is cruel. It's not fair. It's injustice. I'm talking about myself. God is perfectly justified if after all of this I find myself in hell. Because it means, it is clear evidence that I never loved him. I love how David says in Psalm 139, Lord search me and show me if there is anything 
any evil in me. Try my heart. Is there anything offensive to you that grieves you? I'm going to stop there. Can you stand up? Everyone stand up in this place. No distraction, no talking, please. Do you guys realize the very purpose of our existence is to glorify God? Do you guys know that? The reason we exist is to to get amazing grades in grade 12 and become an engineer is that the reason is that the purpose of our existence yes or no please do that but there is a purpose for our existence isaiah 43:7 bring my sons from afar my daughters from the ends of the earth everyone who's called by my name whom i created for my glory we are created with the nature that is fitting to give him glory to put god in display that means when people look at us the way we live our lives god should be glorified Genesis 1:27 says God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created him now we are proud of the fact that we are created in the image of God i want you to pay attention last last 3 minutes you guys know what a statue is a statue a statue is created made in the image of someone else right Let me take an example. Say, let's have a statue of um, Mahatma Gandhi. Okay, we are all Indians, right? So when we go and look at the statue of Mahatma Gandhi, we are not honoring the statue, right? Who are we honoring? We are honoring Mahatma Gandhi, in whose image the statue was built, right? Does that make sense? We are not going to fall at the feet of the statue oh you are great ma no we are honoring mahatma gandhi in the same way if we are created in the image of god when people look at us who is glorified god is glorified not us here's where we fail we are looking for our own glory what can i become what can i do what can god give me but the word of god says we he created us so that he can be glorified we don't like to hear such messages because we live our whole life thinking about ourselves what can i do what will god do for me how, how will god use me I want to bring you the truth that is not my bible that's not my god so I wonder if someone's able to declare this morning god not my way but your way not my desire but your desire i want to fall in love with you jesus before you desire to come on the stage have a desire to have a relationship with god have a desire to fall in love with jesus have a desire to abide in christ show of hands please how many of you would declare god I want to fall in love with you. Can you show show of hands quickly quickly? Keep your hands raised up. Only if you mean it. 
Only if you mean it. It's okay. If you don't want to fall in love with Jesus, that's fine. That's on you. Truly, truly, truly desire, Lord, I want to fall madly, deeply, intimately in love with you. You first in my life you above my education you above my job you above my future you above my family you above people's opinion about me you above the church you above my friends you above the ministry you above everything else at the feet of Jesus everything else becomes meaningless church i tell you a few months ago i was sitting down in prayer with a few friends and all of a sudden in the spirit i felt like god took me to the base of the cross and i looked up and i saw jesus hanging on the cross and that was just two seconds maybe maybe just two seconds but in that moment i tell you church the thought that came into my head is i have no other need in my life at the cross he gave me everything that i could ever need at the cross i saw myself crying out i understand what david says when he says the lord is my shepherd i have no want i shall not want because at the cross at the foot of the cross all of a sudden everything else in life becomes meaningless Oh can we have a generation that truly desires this God who gave it all for us on the cross A generation that says God I have no other need I want every eye closed in this place Jesus I want to give this opportunity to just a few of you If you raised your hands I want you to take a step forward oh, Now this is making things real Now this is putting yourself out there If you have a desire to fall in love with Jesus I'm not going to spend too much time on this I want you to take a step forward and head up here This separates out the pretenders from the real people Those who come up here those who really really have that desire to fall in love with Jesus quickly 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 all over this place take a step forward man jesus all over this place come on come on quickly come quickly quickly make your way forward can you just move forward please move move a little bit forward a little bit forward man jesus as we start singing i can get to all of you but i want you all to just lift your hands up to heaven close your eyes and just declare it lord i want to fall in love with you everyone every eye closed every eye closed you don't need me to come to you it's between you and the lord if you don't feel led to come forward that is fine you can be where you are but if you have that true desire lord 
I want to fall in love with you, Jesus. Just close your eyes and lift your hands up to heaven.
the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever for yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is forever amen yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory for for yours come on lift it up for yours is the kingdom yours is the from this day forth Lord let them walk in the love and the glory and the light of Jesus I thank you Lord that it is done it is done it is done it is done in this place Father God no more place for deception no more no more pretend Christianity but a generation that desires the cross generation that desires Jesus above everything else Lord I speak it over this generation I speak it over this city I speak this over this nation I speak it over the Middle East a generation that cries out and declares Jesus thank you Lord it is finished and so we ask this Lord in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ amen 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 can we give God a clap offering all over this place come on Lord Lord one more time can do better yes you can all go back to your seats Amen. 